is important both for economic terms, as uh, Sheldon's work shows, but more generally, I would say also from an ethical viewpoint, uh, seems to crucially depend on how we can do vaccinations, but not only vaccinations. Uh, vaccinations is one part of a bigger health uh, intervention, I guess, agenda. And you know that you have been working a lot, for example, on testing, on uh, up group appointments. So I want to start uh, uh, by asking a question, what can be done also on the testing side or other, if you like, uh, health interventions? I want to share uh, what I think health equity is, first of all. I feel that health equity is achieved if equal or better quality can be offered at much lower cost. And a lot of my focus is on how can that be done, as opposed to you know what you've already shown is how huge the cost is, the economic cost, if it is not done. And um, as Elias pointed out, I have been uh, doing some work on testing. If you think about testing, COVID testing in particular, there's basically a trade-off that uh, all countries are facing. On the one hand, you have tests like the RT-PCR test, which is, um, they are expensive. They are slow in the sense it is a lab test. It requires sample to be delivered to the lab and then the result has, the sample is processed in the lab and they are accurate tests. Or on the other hand, you have these cheap pregnancy test type of test, which is called a lateral flow point of care test. They are quick, they are cheap, but they are inaccurate. And the question is, is there a way to do the testing in these advanced economies without spending those huge amounts of money? My uh, perspective based on the work I've been doing with multiple researchers is that there is a way to achieve high accuracy at much lower cost. And uh, I'll share with you uh, some of the reasoning behind it and why, in fact, instead of wasting the inaccurate tests, you could do much better by combining. By combining, I mean that for a particular patient in a particular instance, give them two tests. So think about if you had a fair coin and you tossed it, you would think that chance of heads is 50%. But what is the chance you get two heads, right? It's 25%. And what is the chance you get three heads goes down. So similarly, if you had a cheap test, which is you know, as good as a coin toss, there's a 50% chance that you get a false signal, like a false negative. But if you repeated the test or you took two different cheap tests, that's uh, signal is becoming stronger. There would only be a 25% chance that you get a, a false negative, for instance. And similarly, if you did three, it is becoming even uh, a stronger signal. So this is a very simple mathematical idea. And this idea can have profound implications for how we are doing testing. This uh, simple idea we published, uh, my co-authors on this are Sanjay Jain, who is an economist at uh, Oxford and um, Lord Ara Darzi. So consider um, any test. There are two aspects to accuracy. One is sensitivity, which is if you have COVID, what is the chance that the test will pick it up? And in fact, even those cheap tests, uh, which just to give you a sense of the cost, um, uh, an expensive test in the UK is a hundred pounds, in the US is a hundred dollars, even if it's being bought by an institution or a big organization. The cheap tests are one tenth or less the cost. So it could be $10 or pounds, even less than that. But cheap tests are better than a coin toss usually. Let's say you have 60% sensitivity. Specificity is if you don't have COVID, what is the chance that the test will tell you correctly you don't have it? So you've got these two numbers. Now, if you did only one test, it's simple, right? It will either come out plus or minus. But if you got two tests, there are four outcomes. So then you have to decide which outcome, if you get plus plus, should I call that a plus? What about if I got plus minus? So 
what kind of logic is usually used is you think about which costs are bigger. For example, if you're worried about false negatives, so for, uh, if you're thinking of an, uh, a doctor sitting in front of an elderly patient who may have diabetes, asthma, some other comorbidities, the false negative is very costly because that patient is probably going to end up in the ICU, potentially ventilator. It could be life and death for them. And so with the two tests, you would say, well, I'll believe any positive. So that is called the any rule. And if you're doing that, then the only way that um, you could get a false negative is if both the first test and the second test were a false negative, and that goes down, that probability. But on the other hand, if you are in a situation where the false positive is costly, so this could be a young individual who is not living near any elderly people and who is earning and is sending money home, et cetera, uh, you don't really want to uh, declare them as a positive. So here you would say, well, only if doubly positive, I'll call it a positive. So that is called an and rule. And it gives you very few false positives. But the problem is, look at the false negatives, much more false negatives. And similarly, with the any rule, fine, you get less false negatives, but way more false positives. So this is ending up to be, again, a trade-off over here. But now if you say, I'll go and do three cheap tests, because I'm thinking like this, uh, you can say that we have $100 or pounds for one RT-PCR. If you've done two cheap tests, that's only $20. $20. Three cheap tests will be $30. So let's see what you can do with three cheap tests. You can, in fact, break this trade-off you'll actually have eight possible outcome sequences. Just like if you were tossing three coins, you could get plus, 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 minus, et cetera, et cetera, minus, minus, minus. But then how do you classify, right? So if you take the extreme kind of versions of believe um, like only minus, minus, minus is going to be a negative, or if you say any kind of plus is going to be a positive, you are not going to get better than the individual tests because those are very stark trade-offs. But then you could say, well, I'll do majority rule. And majority rule can sometimes work. But in fact, if you think of the number of ways you can classify eight outcome sequences, it's 256 possible classification rules. We've developed a, basically a data-driven methodology that generates optimal classification rules. And by optimal, what I mean is that there will be no other classification rule which can improve both the sensitivity and the specificity that one is getting from using one of our rules. So there will be a trade-off. You might get better on one, but you'll get worse on the other. And with this type of method, basically you can take those same three tests and you can tailor to very different types of patient populations. All of that from three tests and 70% cost saving. Because remember, we started with 100 pounds and we've still got 70 pounds in the pocket. And these tests are also much faster. It's usually 20 to 40 minutes, 45 minutes to get a result. So basically, we are arguing save on those expensive PCRs spend on clever use of rapid tests to increase health equity. I think it's really fascinating because it shows, you know, how very simple statistics and uh, some clever application can save money and at the same time be efficient. Okay, you describe a case where we have one PCR test with $100 cost and three uh, quick tests, rapid tests with $10 cost each. But how about this technique of using pool sampling? with the more accurate PCR tests. So can you please take both questions? Something perhaps with a second. Definitely, the pool sampling is a very excellent idea. And there are countries like Germany has been doing a lot of pool sampling. Um, the idea in pool sampling essentially is that in the first stage, you pool together a bunch of patients and 
if the test comes out negative, then all of them go scot free. If the test comes out positive, then you have to decide on a second stage to either divide in half and do pools or go to individual testing. There's certainly a benefit over there from pool sampling. So I see that you're viewing more as a complement to your idea of multiple yes. rapid yeah. tests rather than a substitute. I had uh, learned about a model called group appointments, shared appointments in the US in fact. The Cleveland Clinic has been doing these for 20 years. And the idea is that if you have um, multiple people who have uh, a particular disease, rather than see them one-on-one, -on -one, if you see five or six of them at once, you can uh, give each one a one-on-one -on -one appointment in front of other patients. So you don't get the private appointment, but you do get the full one-on-one -on -one attention, diagnosis and prescription. And uh, it can obviously save cost for the doctor because they don't repeat stuff. But the patients, some patients are shy. They get to hear somebody else ask questions which are relevant to them. They get much more information, etc. cetera. Delhi medicine has absolutely rocketed 500% or more increase in different parts of the world in telemedicine and smart telehealth can help to bridge the health divide. And this is bringing equity because these people otherwise had no access to care. And interestingly, COVID has allowed telemedicine, which has been around for 15 or 20 years to massively escalate because now there's no other opportunity people are doing it. Here's where our thinking um, was that while this is great, there's a huge shortage today of telemedicine capacity, great shortage. Therefore, if you decided to do virtual shared appointments, that would massively multiply telehealth capacity. This is going to allow shorter waits. When you do shared appointments, the Cleveland Clinic uh, has massively reduced waits uh, and 300% improvement in productivity but in fact, with healthcare, there are huge gaps even within the developing world. This can certainly, this kind of approach can help to uh, reduce that inequity.